Welcome to Kidney Disease Management and Self-Care Around COVID-19. Today's webinar brought to you by collaborative effort of number of organizations that are based in the United States and uh, United Kingdom. The organizations are following. Renal Mates, the Renal Patient Support Group, the University of West of England, the Mission HQ, Renal Diet HQ, well within. I'll be your moderator for today's uh, webinar, and my name is Natalia Karpenko. Great to have you. The millions of Americans uh, have been under the order of shelter in place for the number of weeks, and some of us in California started the shelter in place in mid-March. Entire country experiencing the pandemic as well as the world, and we are looking to flatten the curve by closing non-essential businesses, enforcing the social distancing, and helping to reduce the spread of COVID-19. That means that 316 million people in at least 42 states in the United States have been urged to stay at home. The number of the cases are still increasing across the world, but some of the European countries and Asian have been already experiencing flattening the curve, which means that the number of new cases drastically decrease in those countries. However, United States still experiencing a high number of the new cases. What is important to understand about the flattening the curve? We have to keep uh, enforcing the social distancing uh, to be able to control the pandemic and have capacity within our healthcare system to assess patients who are experiencing COVID-19. The social distancing and isolation at home have been the best strategy to stay safe and protected from the COVID-19. However, there is a vulnerable group of patients as ESRD, patients who still have to go to dialysis three times a week. Those patients couldn't just stay at home and self-isolate. That's why it's very important to provide all necessary support and education for ESRD patients on the hemodialysis, how they can protect themselves during the outbreak. Also important to remember that the vulnerable group of ESRD patients experiencing also the socioeconomical challenges. And many of these patients have to access the food in their local safe banks, and the CEO of American Kidney Foundation already have stated that they have been experiencing a lot of requests by renal patients across the country uh, to help them financially to get access to food, uh, afford transportation, medication. They're certainly working really hard in a fundraising effort. And if you're looking to donate to any nonprofits at this time, American Kidney Fund could be a wonderful organization to donate to, to save lives. I would like to introduce you to the agenda we'll be following on today's webinar. So first of all, remember this, the webinar consists of three parts. The first part is our science-based part speaking about COVID-19, the immunosuppressed, and also isolation, and what does it really mean for immunosuppressed patients? Shahid Mohammed from United Kingdom will be speaking about this topic. The following session will be dedicated to self-care for renal patients. We'll speak about PPE, also how to stay active and motivated at home with Wilson Dew, the renal diet on budget and how to follow ESRD and CKD diet will be presented by Mathia Ford, the renal dietitian. And the final speaker, Elizabeth Conradi, certified health coach, speaking about fear, anxiety, and self-care during the pandemic. The final part of the webinar is dedicated to the patient's experience. We invited Anel Aguirre, she is a post-transplant patient, and Wilson Du. He's been on hemodialysis for three and a half years. And of course, the final, final part of this uh, webinar will be addressing your questions. So make sure you submit those questions below. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to uh, speak to Shahid Mohammed and his topic of COVID-19 and immunosuppressed. 
Shahid, great to have you on this webinar, and please proceed. Uh, thank you, Natalia, for inviting me. Um, it's a privilege to be able to uh, present this um, uh, two-part um, slide set, really, um, or two-topic slide set um, relating to COVID-19. So I'm going to talk about COVID-19, kidney disease, and the immunosuppressed, and COVID-19 isolation, and what does it really mean for the immunocompromised. I am I'm doing this on behalf of the University of Western England in support of the um, fantastic work that the Renal Patient Support Group is doing and um, um, my fellow colleagues um, across the pond in the US have uh, kindly invited me to get in, involved in this. So um, let's proceed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just an overview of what I'll be talking about. It looks quite heavy, but hopefully I'll break it down for everyone and why this session um, uh, was uh, Put together and um, so what we'll be talking about um, initially is a bit of background about a, a poll that was implemented on the renal patient support group a basic intro introduction about what is COVID-19 a bit about the immune system because um, obviously we're patients in CKD um, and uh, renal failure and so forth um, the immuno, immuno um, system, the immune system is actually um, very important to get some baseline understanding around some barrier defenses, some host defenses against viral infections, a little bit about the immunosuppressed and immunodeficiency, CKD and COVID-19, immunocompromised, CKD guidances and COVID-19 guidance, goals of care, summary, and some key points uh, to take home. Thank you. Next slide. So a little bit of background. Um, <clears throat> the RPSG, um, a fantastic group really, um, has actually um, done uh, a lot of work um, for uh, patients in, um, in uh, renal insufficiency, um, acute kidney injury and uh, chronic kidney disease and they implemented this uh, um, uh, poll actually um, what, um, that took place over a one month period in March 2020 um, uh, which was probably the time when COVID-19 was hitting um, um, you know, it, its kind of um, peak period um in um as a pandemic um and uh, the the um the group actually implemented this poll um to highlight um some key topics really that um uh were, were choices uh, for the group to get a handle on um and um uh, lo and behold um these two topics um came up top um so we thought um uh, collaboratively we put um a couple of webinar sessions together and this will this will hopefully hopefully be the first webinar um you know that uh, we put together concentrating on covid 19 and there'll be more sessions to follow so um this is a this is um hopefully be an interesting session but just to highlight this was information from a poll um that was put together uh, first so um thank you next slide <clears throat> so, a bit of introduction about what is COVID-19. So, um, coronaviruses um, are a group of um, viruses that usually cause mild illnesses, such as common, the common cold. However, certain types of coronavirus can infect the lower airway, causing serious illnesses like pneumonia and bronchitis. Um, and most people get infected with a form of coronaviruses um, at some point in their lives. And the majority of the infections or um, the uh, uh, viruses are actually completely harmless. However, the new coronavirus that um, causes COVID-19 or is under the umbrella of coronavirus, that is COVID-19, is a notable um, exception. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, uh, what do we know or what is known about COVID-19 already? Um, so COVID-19 is a new disease, um, but there, um, at, at the present time, um, and um, as this webinar took place, there, there was a little uh, a limited information regarding risk factors for the severity and the severe and for severity and severe disease. Based on currently available information and clinical expertise, older adults, um, particularly the elderly and individuals of any age who have serious underlying medical or clinical conditions might be at the, might be at more uh, risk um, for for this virus next slide please <clears throat> so some understanding about um, basic terminology really i think it's quite important to have that um, so cases of covid19 um, first emerged in late 2019 when it was um, reported in the wuhan province in china 
the cause of the disease was soon confirmed as the as the new coronavirus so it fits under that under that um, uh, umbrella of viruses and um, it soon spread and became um, past an epidemic and, and uh, actually a pandemic so on the 11th of February the World Health Organization or WHO announced that the official name would um, be COVID-19 a shortened version um, of coronavirus disease um, and um, this is not the formal name uh, for the virus however the International Committee on Top Taxonomy of Viruses calls it the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronaviruses and uh, form two um, or SARS-CoV-2 because it actually relates to the virus that caused the SARS outbreak uh, back in 2003. Um, so when the um, when when uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 is highlighted to the uh, through the media to the public, these are the terminologies they use. Is going to be either a coronavirus as a generic term or um, or COVID-19. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so just to highlight um, the total UK uh, COVID-19 cases update in, in the UK. Now, um, uh, th this is um, uh, a slide that was um, taken from the Public Health England, and there's a link there to find out and track um, the tra trajectory of uh, COVID-19 cases and deaths. Um, uh, this was a slide that was um, um, taken on the 10th of April, April so soon after the, um, uh, the live webinar was done, but um, equally important. Um, so the total cases at that time was just over 70,000 um, and um, nearly 9,000 deaths. Um, in England alone, of those 70,000 cases, uh, nearly um, 60,000, nearly 60,000 have come from England alone and um, just over 8,000 deaths in England alone. But when, when we look at the UK, we have put the perspective on England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And so um, actually um, the, the detriment has been quite severe. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> equally, um, I thought it was um, uh, uh, important to highlight um, COVID-19 cases update from the USA. And again, this was um, uh, data that was take, um, uh, identified um, on the 10th of April. And um, uh, obviously the cases, the total cases and deaths um, have increased, unfortunately, but at that, that, that time, it was uh, just over four, um, 400,000 or 450,000. The total cases and the total deaths at that point was just over 16,000 or 16,500. And this uh, data um, can be tracked further um, from the Centers uh, for Disease and Control and Prevention. And uh, there's uh, information around cases, data, and general surveillance. So I thought that would be um, important to highlight uh, considering this is a, a wider audience. Um, thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> so, a little bit about the immune system. Um, so, um, considering that um, you know the general population um, have have a different immune responses it's good to get a, a baseline understanding about the immune system so uh, acute inflammation um, in particular is an uh, early defense mechanism to contain an infection prevent its spread from an initial focus and signal subsequent specific immune responses so depending on what kind of um, foreign body um, is um, potentially attacking um, uh, the physiology or human physiology, the immune system acts accordingly. So three major events actually uh, take place um, in acute uh, inflammation. So this is where you have expansion of capillary, so sort of uh, like blood vessels, um, and uh, to increase blood flow. And typical example, um, uh, not specific to virology or viruses, but um, a, a baseline experience is perhaps like when uh, someone blushes or has a rash, um, increasing um, an increase in permeability of um, microvascular structure. So along with blood flow um, increase, you get um, certain other vasculature um, uh, increased flow as well to allow escape of fluid um, and certain proteins and white cells or leukocytes, and that. Um, 
then results in uh, what we call edema, which is swelling of tissue, um, normally seen um, at, the, you know, at the bottom of ankles, for example. And then number three is exit of leukocytes or white cells from capillaries and their accumulation and response to an infection at the site of injury. And what that means, it's uh, um, as a result, pus can develop. So these are just some um, basic acute inflammation um, elements um, to, to take a bit of understanding from. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In line with that, I think it's important to get an understanding of certain barrier defenses. Um, so uh, innately, um, uh, human physiology is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, human be beings um, have three basic lines of protection against invasion by infection agents. That could be for, um, for you know, protecting um, against bacterial um, infections and viruses um, and other foreign uh, particulars. So these, are, these consist of natural barriers such as the skin, mucus or uh, epithelium and even gastric acid and bile um, and that res restricts the entry of agent um, and then uh, innate anti the non-specific immune uh, defenses such as uh, fever that acts as a as a, a defense as well as a preventative uh, element and certain immune com uh, components and we'll get into those a little bit later and then adaptive antigen specific immune responses such as um, antibodies and T cells and just highlighting in, in, in a diagram there that you've got you know the eyes the respiratory tract skin genital urinary tract and the digestive system as well so those are just some outlines of, of how we have barrier defenses all over us um, protecting us and preventing things um, coming uh, close to us next slide please <clears throat> So uh, I want to just talk a bit about host defences against viral infections. Apologies in advance for uh, a, a somewhat busy slide, but I'll kind of go over this quite quickly. The immune response is uh, the best and in most cases, the only means of controlling a viral infection. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it is the only source of pathogenesis um, of for many, many virus diseases. So unlike bacterial infection, the goal of the immune system or the immune response uh, in a viral infection um, is to eliminate both the virus and the host cell harboring or replicating uh, the virus. So you can imagine um, when it comes to something serious like COVID-19, um, uh, the, the immune system wants to actually stop um, you know, basically a, uh, a host of the, of the COVID-19 to actually be harbored um, and then replicated. So this is the big thing about personal protective equipment for um, health professional workers or key workers, and also um, why uh, those who are immunocompromised and immunosuppressed, they have to be aware of this, of this uh, for these reasons. Uh, so interferons, the amazing um, components really of the immune system, um, and natural killer cells, um, certain components like CD4, T helper cell responses, and CD8, cytotoxic uh, killer cells, actually very important for viral infections. Um, failure to resolve the infection may lead to persistent or chronic infection and death, which is why it's such a big thing to know um, uh, about different types of uh, cell types um, within the immune system. Um, body temperature, fever, uh, interferons, or those components, and other um, uh, as, uh, components such as cytokines. Um, these um, are important um, because they actually provide a local rapid response to a viral infection and activate the uh, specific immune defenses. Often the non-specific de defenses are sufficient. So uh, where I mentioned about barriers in the previous slide, um, those would typically be non-specific in some ways. Um, that would, um, that, that they actually help to prevent the occurrence um, of symptoms in the first place. Um, interferon is, is probably um, the biggest um, uh, component to uh, take uh, a little bit more understanding of because um, it's the body's first active defense against the viral infection in um, an early warning system basically at the local, level, local and systemic levels. So it, it actually promotes or um, uh, highlights the need for other certain uh, cell types to get involved in uh, defending 
or you know protecting or fighting you know in the immune response so it's a very important defense against infection but ultimately it also helps um it's, it's a it can be a cause of systemic symptoms associated with many viral infections such as being tired or that's called malaysia or malaise myalgia or muscle weakness or tiredness uh, chills and fever um, and it's important to know the differences because um, uh, fever can be non-specific as well and it could be like flu-like symptoms so um, it's, it, COVID-19 is going to be much more severe because uh, individuals might have other respiratory problems as well. Next slide please. So yeah, um, just a little bit about immunodeficiency. So uh, this may result in main things um, such as genetic deficiency, starvation, drug-induced immunosuppression, um, and immunosuppression uh, is, a, is an overall cat um, uh, category um, uh, of drugs for treatment, um, uh, such as steroid treatment, cancer, chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic suppression or tissue uh, graft um, uh, rejection and then cancer uh, causes immunodeficiency um, um, and, and I think most of the audience will be aware of that in some respects um, uh, and then um, diseases such as HIV or AIDS as well um, uh, and then um, immunodeficiency actually occurs naturally in those who um, are the, the newborn uh, young um, because their immune system isn't um, developed yet and then the pregnant women. Next slide please. So uh, as Public Health England have uh, highlighted and also uh, the Department of Health in the UK both um, organisations have highlighted that uh, immunosuppressed actually um, uh, are as follows uh, people are age 65 or older, people who live in nursing home or long-term uh, care home facilities, other high-risk conditions could include those with chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma, people who have serious heart conditions, people who are immunocompromised um, and, and on various treatments. Um, in, in some respects that could be termed as polypharmacy or those on multiple medications. People um, of age with um, of any age who are um, are at risk or have obesity, other underlying medical conditions, um, and conditions such as diabetes, obviously CKD or chronic kidney disease or liver disease, which um, is not controlled very well. And then um, those uh, who, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, pregnant women, um, uh, they also fall uh, at, at risk um, potentially. And immunosuppression, um, obviously, for those who are um, post-transplant, um, for example, and taking immunosuppression to prevent the organ from rejection or tissue rejection, um, then um, that causes a dampening of the immune system. So really, um, that is why uh, there is a, a, a strong message for those who are um, on immunosuppression uh, to stay uh, isolated or keep isolated for the time being. Next slide, please. And just uh, a, a quick overview of CKD and COVID-19. Um, so uh, obviously the audience will probably be aware to some extent that CKD is um, recognized um, as a sign of irreversible long-term conditions and, and um, much of the monitoring in these uh, patients, in patients with the CKD, it is um, uh, is it occurs at moderate, moderate um, disease, um, but obviously it can worsen and go into end stage renal disease. Um, and there's a whole conundrum of clinical pathway about how CKD is taken care of. Um, but individuals tend to have a range of bio, biochemical imbalances, including sodium, potassium, and creatinine. Um, and this um, uh, uh, pressure puts pressure on the filtering components called the nephrons. Um, uh, of the kidneys to rid of toxins from the blood um, and then uh, CKD tends to establish itself as a secondary complication owing to obese diabetes or cardiovascular disease and or hypertension and just to take note that um, these are all high risk categories for potentially contracting uh, COVID-19 and 
it's not actually the CKD itself that is um, potentially the problem. It's actually the comorbidities that um, individuals um, might have or are at risk of having that is put, that is causing the, the problem um, in terms of um, information uh, to the general public and those who have the disease. Um, the new coronavirus has also been found uh, to be persistent on um, certain surfaces and so um, it's very important to keep sanitized and clean. The viruses could be diminished uh, by ultraviolet light um, and um, heat or humidity uh, but uh, vitamin D for example is something that most patients might be on uh, for uh, um, bone health and so it's important to keep um, you know keep those supplements uh, um, as part of the general prescription because um, you want to keep healthy in that regard and um, uh, just to highlight though however owing to the nature of COVID-19 uh, it's, it's actually quite important to also note that um, again those who are predisposed to certain comorbidities on multiple meds including immunosuppression are susceptible to infection and this is why there's such a again such a uh, important um, emphasis on being isolated. Next slide, please. So who are the immunocompromised? I mentioned a bit about who are the immunosuppressed. And immunocompromised, um, it actually is not all that different. So those who are on cancer treatment, those who might be smokers or have a history of smoking, those who are um, have uh, bone marrow and stem cell treatment, um, those who have had solid organ transplantation, so anything, um, uh, not just renal, but any other organ transplant, uh, those who are on hemodialysis treatment and who have biochem uh, biochemistry imbalances, immunodeficiency, HIV and poorly controlled AIDS, as mentioned before, and those who are on prolonged use of co uh, corticosteroids. Next slide, please. Uh, so this um, slide um, set really, um, or this slide information really, is, comes from the National Institute of Care Excellent, or NICE, um, in, uh, uh, which is a, a government body in the UK. Um, and uh, this is their information around uh, this, uh, CKD dialysis and COVID-19. Um, so uh, they've outlined uh, that there's, uh, it's important to outline the restrictions to dialysis and transplant patients. Um, uh, owing to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, important, it's been important to highlight where there might be a delay in potential dialysis or transplant services treatment plans, um, outlining risk assessments agreed with local infection control teams when considering using side rooms. So some patients might be um, uh, needing side rooms uh, to treat um, COVID-19 and normally those rooms might be used for other purposes. Um, and then considering, considering uh, those who will have pre-existing pre infections or infectious diseases, and where possible, it may be necessary to encourage patients to have dialysis treatment at home, in isolation, and keeping to prescribed treatment protocols. And then ultimately, um, the guidance uh, encourages patients to self-care more um, because um, of the pandemic. And so there is more sense of taking ownership and uh, shared care in that regard. Next slide, please. So what are the goals of care? So the treatment of patients suffering from COVID-19 may be orientated towards and So what that means is that um, whoever is, um, uh, who has COVID-19 or is definitely at risk, um, uh, those who are admitted, for example, they have a person-centered approach. Um, so um, that's, that's uh, what it means when it's oriented, to, oriented towards. Uh, supportive measures, for example, provision of fluids and or oxygen for those who are identified as severe cases, target uh, treatment, targeted treatment, um, for example, provision of antibiotics to treat pneumonia, but this is to warn off uh, flu-like symptoms and not specific to COVID-19, but part of that care pathway might be that um, if someone has COVID-19, they want to rule out that um, and um, part of that um, treatment plan might be that um, they, uh, uh, health professionals uh, may prescribe antibiotics um, as um, admitted patients um, uh, to warn off pneumonia and then oxygen support. Actually, we hear a lot in the media about that. Um, for example, ventilator support, uh, renal replacement therapy might be something that um, is considered 
uh, to take off any overload fluid. And those who, um, for those who are um, in hospital or admitted patients, I need intensive care units. So the summary here really is there is ever more importance on ensuring that um, uh, there is uh, sufficient and um, appropriate literature understanding uh, from uh, appropriate health professionals around COVID-19. Um, and it's especially um, probably more important now that the that technology is, is also available um, for those who uh, feel especially isolated, for example, at all. Um, you know, websites that can be signposted to um, to support those who are in isolation. Um, and that will bring you know more uh, uh, more uh, professionals and uh, patients working together to help bridge gaps. Um, that's important. And then obviously the diseases such as uh, COVID nineteen and uh, influenza, another you know uh, um, problematic illness, can be fatal um, over due to an overreaction of the um, body's immune system. And so when, they, um, when there's an overreaction, this is when uh, patients who are already, already admitted and have uh, a need for ventilating support, ventilator support, this is a, actually a sign where the, when the immune system is overreacting, it has to, um, it, there's basically a need for uh, the ventilator to support um, oxygen and blood flow to organs so the immune system can take on the virus. So, but when this happens, um, this is when um, there's something called a cytokine storm. We mentioned cytokines earlier, earlier but basically that's what happens um, as part of the immune system, you know, taking, um, taking a hit and, it, and it's overreact. It has to overreact to compensate and to fight off infection. Um, so actually, at the at the end of it, it's important that professionals and patients work together to to um, uh, understand uh, what needs to be done or could be done better um, to to help bridge gaps in care. Thank you. So the key points really um, nothing new um, in terms of um, what's been said by um, uh, not. Uh, not least the media, but you know, organisations across um, uh, across the globe, uh, CDC, uh, Public Health England, Department of Health, World Health Organisation. They're all saying pretty much the same thing, and and that is to stay safe, stay well, stay isolated, um, but also obviously keep active as much as possible in these difficult times. Next slide. So I put together a, a reading list if anyone's interested. So that's what that list is. Next slide. Uh, yeah, and I was your host, uh, Shahid Mohammed, and uh, on behalf of the University of Western England, delivering this for the Renal Patient Support Group. Thank you. Shahid Mohammed, thank you so much for such an informative session and sharing all of the information and the key points, key goals for the immunosuppress to be able to better understand the pandemic and managing their home isolation. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm looking forward to invite you to the second part of today's webinar dedicated to the self-care during home isolation. A few words about myself. I'm a founder at Renal Mates and I'm also a patient advocate. Renal Mate provides program that help to manage daily lifestyle of uh, renal patients, help them to be more educated and informed, to make a better decisions on a daily basis, to manage uh, renal diet, stay more active, motivated, uh, have a strong supportive community of coaches and other patients, and ultimately improve quality of life. What is very important for the medical teams that patients who are following better regimen and more adherence, they're showing better outcomes on their labs and also reducing unnecessary hospitalization. I'll be speaking about the precaution and protective tips and we'll overview the other topics that are very necessary in your household to be aware of. What's important to remember about the environment? The rule of thumb that um, the virus lives from 48 to 72 hours on the surface. To be more specific, the virus lives in the air up to three hours and the car works up to 24 hours on plastic and still up to 72 hours. And if you bring any 
food from your grocery stores that have to go in your freezer, actually you have to clean this foods and packaging before you put in the freezer because this freezing you do not kill the virus. I want to make sure to bring it up to you. Washing your hands is very important. Uh, think about the virus is um, being covered in fatty envelope and in contact with water and soap, it separates. That helps to dry out virus. So even uh, though when we wash our hands, some germs can stay on our hands and it's important to wipe them with a the towel. If you're in public place, make sure you use a paper towel. If you're at home, you can use paper try, uh, towel or your individual towel. It's the best case for immunosuppressed population to have own hand towel to dry your hands after washing them. Using masks um, is very important because they protect us from touching our face and also protecting from the exposure to the virus. There are a variety of masks and the 95 is one of the uh, most protective masks. It doesn't still protect 100%, but it does help uh, uh, to protect uh, uh, from the virus um, exposure. A surgical mask, PM 2.5, and also bandanas and bandanas cloth mask with the layers. Oh, glasses, clear or prescription, gloves, soap and water, hand sanitizer, and alcohol wipes. And again, speaking about the protective masks, you can actually make your own bandanas and make sure to look some tutorials how to add additional filter layer insert into your mask. Very important to remember that taking your mask off and putting it on is have to be a very critical activity that you do and you pay attention to it. So first of all, you have to wash your hands and make sure that a mask fits snugly to your face. And when you're taking your mask again, wash your hands prior and take it very carefully without touching the inner layer. You may reuse your mask or you may dispose that. If you will be washing your mask like bandana or cloth mask, make sure you use temperature 140 Fahrenheit or 60 degree of Celsius or higher temperature to be able to kill the virus while washing. So let's speak about groceries and bringing food home. Imagining glitter, imagining that uh, anything you bring from outside is covered in glitter and your goal is to not bring any glitter on your hands, on your face, on your packages and your food back at home. Make sure you use as a disinfectant from uh, products like wipes, soap and water. You take unnecessary packaging and dispose it and recycle it right away. Take some items like bread and chips uh, and dump them in a into clean plastic container without even touching them. Make sure you clean fruit and vegetables really well. Very important to have a plan. As a plan, as many of us have stuck up with the supplies, uh, food and medication, also avoiding public transportation, avoiding crowds, non-essential travels, uh, having a dedicated person running errands, Think about what do you do when you're outside, using your PPE, your mask, your gloves, your hand sanitizer, making sure if you end up going to the grocery store, you remain a safe distance. You have to be an advocate for your safety in you know, COVID-19. What is very important when you come back, cleaning those groceries, also disinfecting your hands and keeping reminding your family members that they have to disinfect their hands and do not touch their face when they outside. You can use a variety of services as a delivery service and uh, uh, you also uh, can learn how you may able to pay or even tip in online. Also for your laundry, uh, you have to remember that uh, you have to wash your clothes in a warmer setting and disinfecting your laundry hamper too and just say, keep that in mind. Don't shake your laundry to avoid spreading virus in the air. You have to avoid gas at this time and any gatherings are prohibited. Um, if you live with other members uh, in your family, uh, try to keep the social distancing and avoid sharing the living space as much as you can.
If someone gets sick, you have to have a plan. You have to contact the doctor, isolate the person in a separate room, disinfect frequently the surfaces, avoid sharing items, uh, wear the gloves, continue wash your hands frequently, ask them wear masks. Also, there's something to bring up about the pets. The pets are not immune to COVID-19. During the pandemic, keeps your pets closer to home. Uh, ferals and cats have higher risk uh, of um, potentially getting COVID-19 from the recent study in UK. Uh, the virus uh, spreads uh, poorly in dogs, uh, pigs, chickens, and ducks. And the last thing I want to share with you is the technology enabling stay connected to the world during this pandemic. Learn about telehealth. Your doctor may already suggest the proper technology they are using or technology like Zoom. Uh, stay connected to others. You can arrange uh, the online uh, events, uh, see people uh, through the camera. You can celebrate, you can speak, you can support each other. You can use for free technology like Skype, WhatsApp, Google Hangouts, there are so many great resources online and many of them right now are provided by free uh, by companies like Coursera, Umidy, uh, Digital Promise. So make sure you go online and learn about uh, some of these uh, free and available resources. I believe our speakers will be sharing a little bit more what you can do in your leisure time. Also think about wellness. This is a good time for learning different technology and um, how you can practice uh, uh, exercise, build a new routine, and we'll send you, we'll share some of the great streaming technology available in their company. Also podcasts, books, and music. This is a great time to find entertainment as well as learning something new. You can subscribe to the iTunes podcasts, uh, Google podcasts, Spotify. You can listen audiobooks and also utilize an additional services meal deliveries and grocery deliveries uh, thank you so much for your attention and i'm thrilled to introduce you to wilson Dew and um, his programs this is wilson uh aka uh, reno warrior many of you do know me as reno warrior over there on uh, instagram and facebook social media um I've, I've been a dialysis patient for the past uh three and a half years and uh, since then, I've been a, a huge kidney disease patient advocate. Um, I've, I've done uh, multiple uh, athletic events, so I consider myself an athlete. I, I, and I've dedicated the past few years of helping kidney disease patients uh, as much as I can. Um, that leading up to you know, doing all of these uh, physical events. We did a bike ride 2018 from uh, San Francisco, California, all the way down to San Diego, California. Uh, in 2019, we did a uh, Olympic distance triathlon uh, with the support of uh, a lot of folks in the kidney community. And, you know, the, the final project that we're working on, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is, is uh, the Mission HQ. It's a local gym here in the Bay Area, California, uh, where we are, it's, you know, it's not just a gym. We, we call it a gym with a mission, the Mission HQ. And our primary mission is to help the chronically ill uh, the elderly, uh, kidney patients, kidney wars like yourselves, uh, as well as um, just anybody in the community that's looking to start their physical journey. Um, and I wanted to go over a little bit about where my journey started off. Uh, through uh, June of 2016, I was diagnosed with uh, kidney disease or kidney failure, stage five. And uh, at the time I was 315 pounds, unable to walk, uh, extremely high blood pressure, and was told to prepare for the end of life. Um, long story short, uh, I decided that this wasn't gonna be the end all be all and decided to fight. And I, I, took, a, I took a few steps, started with just a few steps and it ended up with uh, doing the bike ride, uh, uh, going around the country, speaking to other patients, speaking to medical professionals, and uh, ended up doing uh, you know all of these events all the way up to the point where uh, we have the mission hq and the, the biggest thing that kept on ringing in my mind was that i choose life it was always that 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 i chose life over death and that i wasn't going to go down without a fight next slide please um where you can find out uh, more of the story and and also resources to help out other kidney patients is uh 
the Mission HQ, a warrior fitness facility that's dedicated to us. We're all warriors actually fighting this battle. And that's the gym located here in Alameda, California. But you can find me on Instagram at Reno Warrior 2016 or at the Mission HQ Fitness. Uh, Facebook is going to be at Reno Warrior and uh, at our nonprofit page, which is at Reno Warrior Institute. Um, next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, we were looking at, uh, here, here's some of the things that, that I've completed uh, weight. Uh, currently, as of today, I'm 190 pounds. We completed a bike ride, 550-mile uh, bike ride in 2018. Completed Olympic distance triathlon in August 2019. Uh, the Mission HQ was established in July 2019. And again, our mission is to provide free training to kidney patients and the elderly. And also, war, the warrior class is what we call it. That's the class that we uh, train kidney patients is now free for everyone via Zoom due to the pandemic. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of exercise, especially now that we are um, in the shelter in place. Most of the country is in the shelter in place, and there is a lot of time to actually do a lot of these things. Now, some people think that I don't have access to a gym, I'm not able to go out, I'm immunocompromised, so I can't do it, or I'm not supposed to do this or that. But you know, you can actually get a whole lot done. Um, at home. Now, some of the benefits of exercise, you're able to increase your strength, mobility, balance, um, help with recovery times, and weight management. Now, a lot of us that are, have been uh, diagnosed with kidney disease, a couple of the leading factors of uh, kidney disease is uh, high blood pressure as well as diabetes. Now, a lot of that comes with uh, being overweight, uh, not able to control your diet, uh, recovery times, if there's any type of surgeries or any type of medical issues, it's difficult to recover from that. And, you know, if you're overweight, a lot of times it's difficult. Your mobility and your, your, your strength is just not all there. And exercise alleviates a lot of those issues. So it's important that you do get the, uh, get the exercise. I know for myself, when I was 315 pounds, when I was diagnosed, I was pretty much told that I could not get a transplant because of my weight. And once the weight was under control, then that was approved. I was able to get on the list and hopefully uh, be able to uh, get a kidney sometime soon. Now, some of the, the, the purposes and, and some of the effects that the exercise does have, not only with just uh, the strength, the recovery time, or the weight management, you're looking at just as mentally it's going to help you. It's going to clear your mind a little bit. And it's going to help you with your mindset. It gives you a purpose. You'll have goals. Um, and if you, if any of you were in any of our LEP programs, uh, you would have heard me speak about the importance of goals. How important it is to actually have a goal, something that you're you're working towards. I know that when I was going through my physical journey, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't looking at wow, I'm 315, 315 pounds. I need to get down to 220 pounds. It was more of my goal was to lose one kilo a week, which is 2.2 pounds. And that was, that was my goal. And I just kept on looking for those goals and kept focus on that. Um, the benefits of hitting your goals is gaining a lot of confidence. Um, it leads you to be able to face other battles. Now, what I mean by that is that if you're constantly winning these little battles, hitting these little markers, hitting these little goals, it's every time you hit a goal, or even if it's a small goal, whether it's um, not drinking the soda for the day, not eating any fried foods, not eating the donut that you wanted for today. And once you build up uh, day to day, you hit, hit these little goals, over time, you're putting a little bit of confidence in the bank every time. So then when you hit something where your face was a, something a little bit larger, like a surgery or, or something like that. It's going to give you the confidence to face these things and gives you the confidence to fight that because you have maintained the discipline by uh, creating those goals uh, with your exercise, with your diet, whatever that may be. So that is, uh, all of that is extremely important. Now, if any of you have any questions regarding that, how to get started, uh, there, there's resources for you, reach out to me. I'll, I'll, I'll be more than, than willing to help out uh, anybody. And I'll, 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 I'll respond to most and all of my emails or, 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 or direct messages is the warrior class. Now, um, over here at the Mission HQ, it's a, it's a physical gym in Alameda, California. It's a local gym in Alameda, California. And we were having um, 
physical classes where people would come into the gym, we would train them, give them the attention that they need. And unfortunately, uh, through the pandemic and the shelter in place, we're not able to actually have that where we have to shut down. But that doesn't mean that the, our mission stops. Our mission still continues to move forward because every single one of us that's on dialysis with kidney disease, the disease doesn't stop for the pandemic. So we don't stop because everybody else still needs help. Now, what we've done is uh, we've devised a program uh, where we are doing it virtually. So now the warrior class, uh, all of you are invited and I will uh, make sure that we get the, the link sent out to everybody. It's via Zoom. Uh, patients of all sorts uh, in the community, a, a community of peers. So you're not just kidney disease patients, not just dialysis patients, but we have, again, cancer patients, stroke victims. Um, uh, we even have uh, uh, some folks that are in hospice. Now, again, it's a, it's a low impact training designed for all fitness levels and everybody can do it. All you really need is a chair and maybe a, a strap or a belt so you can do some stretches. Now that class is Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's approximately 50 minutes. Now, some of the results that, 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 that we've had is, is uh, obviously there's a lot of the patients in there has had some success with weight loss. A lot of them has gained mobility, but the number one thing is the confidence. Again, I can't stress that enough. The confidence to actually move around a little bit more, the confidence to actually go shopping, uh, we even have a couple of elderly patients that have fallen a couple of times, but were able, was able to brace themselves. So I'd like to invite all of you to come out to that class. Now, I don't teach that class. Uh, when I started um, with my training right outside of the hospital um, uh, a few years back, uh, I was able to work with a personal trainer. Her name was Molly McGee, and she's uh, gave me the, the routine and the regimen uh, to get me stronger and better and faster so that I can go on to bigger and harder workouts. Now, she is now uh, the one leading this class. So uh, you're in for a real treat. She's a, a, a very gentle soul and that she will, uh, she's been doing this for a while and she, she'll, she'll definitely help you out. So come on in, check out the warrior class. You're all invited. But uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's um, the importance of exercise. And again, you all have these resources available to you. So give it a shot, you have nothing to lose. All right. Thank you very much. Wilson, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your story, inspiring us, and also sharing all the great resources Mission HQ provides for patients. Our next speaker, Mathia Ford. Mathia is a registered dietitian, and I'm really looking forward to hear her advice about healthy nutrition during this challenging time. Welcome, Mathia. Okay. Hi, I'm Mathia Ford, registered dietitian, licensed dietitian, and I have um, been working as a registered dietitian for over 22 years, and I have over 15 books about kidney disease on Amazon that you can find. I have a website, renaldiethq.com, and um, I've been working specifically with kidney disease for the last um, probably six or seven years. And I've learned a great deal about kidney disease. But as a dietitian today, I want to talk to you about the diet for chronic kidney disease. So there's a couple different um, stages for kidney disease that you might have that is has a little bit different diet. So there's pre-dialysis before you start um, dialysis, CKD stage three, stage four, where you're going to focus on eating a variety of foods, still eating a healthy diet but having a lower protein and a lower sodium intake and watching potassium and phosphorus if necessary. So when I say if necessary, what I really mean is if your doctor has told you that your elevated levels of blood in your blood are potassium or phosphorus and you need to reduce those. A lot of times when people get diagnosed with kidney disease, they'll be given a list of foods that is high in potassium and they think that's what they need to restrict. And that is kind of the old thinking. Whereas the current um, research evidence base is that you need to eat lower protein, lower sodium. And then if you have elevated potassium, then you should try to limit those higher potassium foods. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about potassium and phosphorus in a minute, but I want you to be aware that your main job when you have pre-dialysis is to manage your related conditions, eat a variety of food, 
and eat a little bit lower protein than sodium. And I'm going to get into exactly what that amount is in a minute. If you have dialysis, if you're on dialysis, a lot of times you're going to a center. You may have a few different, there's a few different types of dialysis. There's in-center, there's home dialysis, there's peritoneal dialysis. All of those can make a little bit different um, nutritional needs, but in general, it's gonna be a higher protein amount. You're still gonna have limited sodium. You're probably gonna be limited on the amount of fluid you can take in, and you're probably gonna have potassium and phosphorus limitations dictated by your doctor or your nephrologist. They're gonna tell you how much you can have. And then if you're post-transplant, um, after you've had a transplant, a lot of the limitations are lifted because you have that working kidney, but usually related more to the medications, you have a um, tendency to have maybe some diabetic complications. So you may want to um, manage your uh, carbohydrate intake at that time. So the renal diet is really about getting quality protein just not too much protein. And then if you have micronutrient deficiencies or um, elevations, what happens is over time with your kidneys, they are less able to process those um, different types of micronutrients. So they tend to build up in your bloodstream, which means then you have to manage how you uh, take them in. But for the most part, you start with sodium, which helps with blood pressure and um, lowering your protein. Protein in your body is um, like a waste product in your body. Um, once we use it for all those different hormones and um, nutrients in our body, building, building cells, our body takes um, what's left over from that and it makes a waste product and our kidneys take that out of our blood. What happens when your kidneys have reduced functionality is they're not able to remove that as easily. So let me get into some of the specifics of the diet. When you're talking about protein, one of the things for hemodialysis um, or peritoneal dialysis is that you need a higher amount of a higher quality protein, which is usually 1.3, 1.2 to 1.3 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So here in the US, we tend to weigh by pounds. In the UK, you may weigh by kilos or stones. Whatever it takes to convert that um, in the United States, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds of body weight. So I do easy math. So 220 pound person would be 100 kilos and they would need 120 to 130 grams of protein per day if they were on dialysis. Now I have a notation here to make about half of your protein daily uh, from high biological value protein. Those are animal products. Um, they can be eggs, they can be meat, fish, um, and if you're vegan or vegetarian, you just want to try to make sure you're getting higher quality uh, beans, legumes, nuts, those types of things. But um, if you're not vegetarian, then you just want to make sure that you're getting the best um, high quality protein. You don't want to you don't want to get um, all of your protein from like grains because those aren't necessarily complete and going to give you all the amino acids that you need. So you want to make sure that you're getting that complete um, healthy high biological value protein. Just means that your body can digest that easily. CKD stage three and four, which is pre-dialysis. Um, I want to encourage you that you should not eliminate all protein to try to slow down your progression to end stage renal disease. It is a limited diet. It does have less protein, but your body needs that protein as building blocks of cells and hormones. And it does a lot of other things with your body and you're actually putting yourself in a worse um, nutritional stage, nutritional condition as you progress to kidney disease, as you progress to dialysis, if you're uh, nutrient depleted by not having enough protein. I've had patients tell me that their doctors told them to eat only vegetables and fruit, and honestly, that's very poor advice. You need to make sure you're getting the minimum amount of protein that you need, and that amount with chronic kidney disease pre-dialysis is the lower amount of 0.6 to 0.75 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. So same 100 kilogram person, pre-dialysis, they're gonna need um, 60 to 75 grams of protein per kilogram per day. Um, so you may be wondering how much is a gram of protein? And what I would tell you is that in general, um, one egg or one ounce of meat or 
fish contains seven grams of protein. Um, one cup of milk contains seven grams of protein. So if you're allowed 70 grams per day, that would be 10 ounces of meat. Now you do get meat from, you do get protein intake from other products. So again, grains, some fruits, um, some different um, beans, legumes, milk. So you're gonna try to get about half of your protein that you need. So if you had 75 grams of protein that you needed, about half of that you're gonna try to get from actual protein products. And then the rest you're probably gonna get from different um, nutrients in your diet. Phosphorus, so again, ensure um, you are talking to your doctor. If they tell you to limit phosphorus, they're typically gonna give you some sort of phosphorus binder. Um, but for hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, it's expected that you're gonna be limited to do about 800 to 1,000 milligrams per day. Again, both cases, I tell you phosphorus levels in the blood are difficult to control with your diet. You need to take your prescribed binders with meals for them to work. So if your doctor has prescribed you Tums or another type of binder, you need to take them with the meals. What they're doing is binding to that phosphorus in the food and keeping an inner digest digestive tract. So by eating them with meals, then you're allowing them to work most efficiently. If you take them too far ahead or too far after, they're not gonna do their binding properly. And then the other thing I wanna encourage you to do is make sure you're getting a full session of dialysis. Make sure you're staying for the full amount of time or if you're doing it every day, make sure you're allowing it to work through that full process. Um, the first part of the dialysis process removes a lot of waste product, but then as it kind of goes a little bit longer, that's when you're able to get more of that phosphorus and other um, high elevated levels out of your bloodstream. And then for stage three and stage four, and beyond. Um, you would limit it if you were told by your doctor to limit it. But the important thing to know is that when you decrease your protein intake, say, uh, you know, you decrease down to the 60 grams per day, protein kind of comes with phosphorus. They're kind of married together. Um, so when you decrease your protein intake, then you're um, decreasing your amount of phosphorus just naturally. So it's typically is not a need to restrict until you get really close to stage five. Um, and again, phosphorus levels in the blood are difficult to control with just diet alone. So if you have elevated levels, typically you're going to need to take a binder. Um, so potassium. Potassium is a huge one because everybody wants to start with this one and really start with protein and sodium. If I can say that one more time, I will start with protein and sodium, do not start with potassium. Potassium should only be restricted if your labs show that you're elevated. For hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, typically um, based on labs, and if they have high levels, then 2,400 milligrams or less per day. Um, you need to ask your doctor at all times, you know, are there medications that might affect this? There are certain medications, diuretics, blood pressure medicines, that might affect your potassium levels. So you need to ask your doctor as you see your potassium level elevating, if it's getting close to that edge, ask them, are there medications that are gonna affect that level? And if so, is there a better choice that doesn't affect this? Because um, there are different choices, but that's definitely a discussion you should have with your doctor. And don't restrict your labs unless you have high potassium. I mean, don't restrict your potassium unless your labs show they're high. So healthy eating. Um, a lot of people tell me when they get put on this diet that all of a sudden all the healthy eating that they've been told to do goes out the window. And I used to agree with them, but actually with these new guidelines, you still should eat a variety of healthy foods, uh, fruits and vegetables for as long as you can and not restrict the main things, again, sodium and potassium. So I wanna talk, I mean, sodium and protein, sorry about that. So, so I wanna go through some thoughts related to this um, home you know, isolation that we're doing. And a lot of people might be using a lot of canned foods or non-perishables. So one of the, some tips that I have for you there are to look for the lower sodium options. And if you don't get a low sodium option, rinse canned vegetables and that will lower the sodium. So you pour out the liquid and then you rinse them off and you um, use fresh water with that, that'll lower the sodium significantly. 
eat a variety of fruits and vegetables, so try to get green and yellow and red, all those different colors. If you're eating a canned fruit, make sure that it's packed in 100% juice or um, a light syrup. You don't want the heavy syrup that's very sugary. You can make your own broth for a lower sodium option. And later on, I'm gonna tell you that you can cook a whole chicken and then peel all the meat off of it. Sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. But you can use that um, bone, that carcass of the chicken to make chicken broth that is excellent for you to use to make some soups. Um, using dry pasta or rice in meals to extend the portion without adding more protein. Dry pasta and rice have like three grams of protein per serving versus meat having seven grams of protein per ounce. So if you want to make uh, more volume in your meal, which when I grew up, my grandmother, my mother did this, you put more pasta or more rice in that so you have the volume of the food on the plate or when you eat, you feel fuller, but you're not adding that protein. And then beans can be a good source of low fat and high fiber protein. Um, and you do absorb less phosphorus from beans. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but um, it's really important to know that you can use beans and mix them with some meat maybe and get some good, healthy, uh, more fiber and um, still get your protein that you need. So let's talk about labels for a minute. This picture is highlighting the difference in sodium intake and that's why it's important to get the reduced sodium type um, canned foods. But read the labels for added phosphorus and in the new ingredients section of the label, what you're gonna see is the word PHOS and that'll be part of another word, sodium monophosphate, phosphoric acid. Those indicate added phosphorus. So that's the kind of phosphorus you want to avoid. You want to know, you should know that you absorb about 50% of the phosphorus from plants. So people tell me all the time that beans are high in phosphorus or avocados are high in phosphorus. And the whole thing about those is you're only absorbing about 50% of that naturally occurring phosphorus. It's just not available for our bodies to absorb. When you eat animal products, you're absorbing about 75% of the phosphorus that's in those. So remember I said meat comes with phosphorus kind of naturally. You absorb about 75% of the available um, phosphorus in that food. But when you eat foods that have added phosphorus, um, that are added to uh, do all different kinds of things um, to make them flavor better, to make them last longer, whatever, you absorb 90 to 95% of that phosphorus in the food. So what I want to encourage you to do is to read that label, especially on canned foods, and when you're making a choice, choose the one that does not have those phosphorus um, ingredients in there. So if you have two cans of um, canned corn, for example, which I don't think is going to have a lot of phosphorus, but you look at one and you look at the other, you read the ingredients, one has that phos, one does not, pick the one without. Phosphorus is not listed on labels but it is um, easy enough to kind of see that added phosphorus amount and to just avoid that in general and that'll make you healthier. Uh, something else I wanna highlight here, you can typically have a little bit of everything, um, a little bit of what you want, but probably not a huge amount. You may have to choose it less often, you may have to choose a smaller portion, but you can still have a little bit of that. So I'm really big on not getting rid of all the food that you want to eat, but to try to manage it within your diet by eating a, a more appropriate amount of it. Thinking ahead, so if you have someone who is coming to your help, house to help you cook, or who's helping you prep meals, or you get tired, and um, you know, you need some help, uh, you would like some things that you can cook ahead. One thing, so these are some of the foods that I cook ahead to save time and to make it easy to grab and put together. So rice, you can batch cook rice and put it in the fridge. It'll last three or four days. It goes in a lot of different meals. You can batch cook beans. Um, you can take dry beans, soak them. You can cook them for, um, you, you know, using over a period of time, adding them a little here and there. You can roast vegetables, keep them in your fridge for three or four days, and then just warm them up when it's time. And I personally like the taste of roasted vegetables more than boiled or, you know, cooked type things. So I like the roasting process. So you can roast them ahead. Um, 
for your sweet tooth, you can make some muffins or cupcakes, obviously cupcakes without the added frosting and cookies. You can batch those. You can freeze them in single portions and then take them out when you're ready to eat them. If you like to have a bran muffin for breakfast, make them ahead, keep them and make it at one a day at breakfast. Hard boiled eggs. You can make hard boiled eggs ahead of time and they're great to put on salads or um, to make some egg, egg salad sandwiches, that type of thing, or just to eat in general. They're very good thing to have cooked and they're quick to eat and they can kind of give you a little bit of fullness. They are protein though. Meatballs, you can make up meatballs ahead of time, cook them, and then you have almost like a portion control. So if you know you need three ounces and you have one ounce meatballs, you can have those um, ready to go and to cook three or four with your meal, then you're controlling the amount of protein you're getting and you also make it easier to make kind of a meal. You can cook soups and stews ahead of time. You can cook a whole chicken. You can roast a whole chicken or get a rotisserie chicken and then take all the meat off the bones and all that meat you can chop up and you can use to make sandwiches. You can put them on salads. And then again, take those bones and make yourself some broth. Hamburger meat is also a great thing to um, cook ahead and kind of have available to put on, um, make some tacos, make some different kinds of, um, you know, put it on your spaghetti, that type of thing. So those are some ideas. I wanna go through a few little freezer tips. Um, so you don't wanna freeze eggs or salad like lettuce. You don't want to freeze egg-based sauces or dairy or raw potatoes. Um, so the first few, they actually separate and kind of taste yucky. Raw potatoes just have too much liquid in them, so they don't taste very good if you unfreeze them. Um, you should freeze foods immediately if you're not going to use them in the next two to three days. So when you're having leftovers or if you're making something and you have leftovers and you know you're not going to eat it in the next couple of days, you should immediately package it and freeze it and mark um, right names and dates on the food when you freeze them. So uh, a lot of food looks very similar when you're um, cooking it or when you're getting it out of the freezer. So it's important to know the date that you put it in there and the name of what it was. And um, again, with the meats, you should remove them from the store packaging and repackage them, put them in a bag and um, instead of freezing them in the store packaging. For liquids like soups, if you want to freeze some soups ahead, then it's a good idea to lay them flat when you freeze them, and then you can stand them on the side to store them so you can kind of stack up almost like a little bookcase. So just don't let them freeze in kind of a big puddle. It's so much easier if they're flat, and then they defrost much easier too. Pack your freezer. Your refrigerator is more efficient when you kind of have the room for the airflow but your freezer is more efficient when it's full, when it has more stuff packed in there because that cold just helps it stay colder. And then um, I wanna tell you kind of a little bit about freezing, refreezing. So you should not refreeze certain foods at certain stages. So if you have a raw food and you, and you froze it and then you thaw it, you need to cook it again before you freeze it. So your raw foods, then you cook it and then you don't eat all of it, then you freeze it. And then the next time you thought to eat it, you should either eat it or discard it. You should not refreeze it. Those are just kind of food safety things. <coughs> mm, excuse me. So some items to always kind of have in your house um, that are make it easy to put together some dishes. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, some dishes you can put together. But pasta, easy to use in a variety of dishes. Angel, angel hair noodles, spaghetti noodles, egg noodles, just regular noodles. They work in casseroles. They work in lots of different soups. Uh, you have rice. It's easy to store, quick and inexpensive. You can keep tuna or chicken packed in water. Um, they make quick meals, and it's easy to eat hot or cold. And it can store longer because it's usually canned. And eggs, eggs are quick meals, making omelets, poached eggs, fried eggs, pancakes, all different kinds of things. You, you can always have canned beans and legumes because they work in lots of recipes. You can also have dried, but dried just tend to take a little longer. So if you're looking for something quick, you can use some canned beans. Canned vegetables, low sodium, or do the process like I told you before with rinsing them. You have frozen vegetables. Um, they can save a lot of time in cooking and they're usually low in sodium because they're 
kind of frozen at the point of use. They actually can have more nutrients than fresh sometimes because they're frozen at the point of uh, purchase or point of uh, harvest. And then you're able to, it saves a lot of that nutrient in there right away. Always have fresh fruits and vegetables. Whatever's in season is gonna be lower in cost and lower sodium because they're fresh. So easy to use and have in your house. And then potatoes, you can make a variety of meals and side dishes. If you're not watching your potassium, you can eat, um, you know, potatoes. I would mix it up with, with noodles and rice, but you can have those as part of your uh, schedule. So I wanna go over a few simple recipes that just to remind you that a lot of recipes are just things to put together kind of in a um, order. So a salad is really just lettuce, romaine or iceberg, and then you put a little cheese, you can put some fruit, you can put fresh or canned vegetables, you can put nuts, you put that protein. So that chicken that you peeled off, the whole chicken that you cooked or rotisserie, you can dice it up, you can put it on a um, salad, you can put beef on a salad, turkey, you can use beans, and then do some set of, sort of oil and vinegar dressing or a mixture of oil and vinegar with some herbs. Um, but it's really simple to make a salad. So if you keep, you know, fresh lettuce, then you can easily make up a salad that's good for you and tastes good. I want to remind you that omelets are <laughs> really good meals regardless of the time of day. So two eggs and then some cheese, meat, vegetables, add some seasonings like oregano or um, I personally like cumin and chili powder, just gives it a little spice. So it's easy to put together and it's something that you can have in the house and you can make with all those things I told you you should kind of keep in the house. Again, if you don't like any of these things or you want to get a little less protein or a little less something else, you can adjust them to not use, but the base of your item, the omelet is the eggs or the um, salad is the lettuce, is always the same. So then you add these other things, it makes a good meal. And a quick casserole. So in general, Casseroles are nice to make for groups of people or even just to eat over a few days. And you can use a nine by 13 inch dish and it takes one to one and a half protein, one, and a half, one to one and a half pounds of protein, uh, three to four cups cooked vegetables, two cups of starchy vegetables or grains, some liquid, a little bit of topping, you mix it together, you add the topping, you bake it 350 degrees for 30 to 45 minutes. If you want to make these ahead, you can put them in a nine by 13 dish, mix them all up, and then put them, put a liner in the dish, put the casserole in the dish, freeze it, and then take it out of the dish and put that in a baggie. And then you have your dish to use, but then when you're ready to cook, it just fits right in the dish and you cook it in the oven. So I want to um, just kind of go over some other tips. Make sure you're understanding your prescriptions and how to take them either with meals, before or after meals. If you have questions, call your doctor's offices. They're still there. They're still gonna answer your questions. They're still gonna call you back. Manage your related conditions as well as you can. Try to control your diabetes and your blood pressure. If um, doing certain things, I know Elizabeth's gonna talk about reducing your stress, but sometimes your stress, reducing that can help lower your blood pressure, help control your blood sugar. Follow low to sodium diet, don't use salt substitutes. Usually if it's a white sub salt substitute, it's potassium chloride, which is something you don't wanna add a whole bunch of to your diet. Um, I want you to focus on eating a variety of foods. I see too many people severely restricting, cutting back the variety of foods and not eating enough calories. Maybe you're afraid of eating fat, you've heard fat is bad for you but you can eat the healthy fats like the olive oil and the avocados. Those are healthy fats, those are good for you. Um, people not eating enough protein, either on dialysis, they're not getting enough because there's a larger amount they need to eat, or they're worried pre-dialysis that they shouldn't eat protein. All of those, you need to know how much protein you should eat and then try to get to that amount. If you're eating more processed foods, which I hope you're doing a little better at home to cook the, um, to eat the uh, more home-cooked meals, but Processed foods are higher in sodium, so try to figure out if you can make those from scratch at home or make at least more of it from scratch. Common issues are trying to stick to a strict list of foods. That's what I was talking about, where you get that list from the nurse when you first get diagnosed, or you start trying to cut out all these foods and you're, you're sticking to the strict list of foods and it gets real boring real quick. So I want you to try to eat a variety of foods. 
cooking at home is much healthier. You don't need to add salt when you're cooking. Try to add those herbs and other spices and vegetables. Use more spices. And then I want to encourage you to get started to improve and don't try to change everything at first. Just try to change one or two little things and then move on from there. My Thea, thank you so much. It was a really great session. I appreciated your advice about managing renal diet during pandemic and all the tips about simple renal friendly recipes. I'm really looking forward to try some of those, especially ideas with salads and adding more protein into our diet. So moving to the next speaker of today's webinar, Elizabeth Conradi. Elizabeth, she's a health coach based in California, and uh, I'm excited to dive into the wellness, uh, self-care, and ways how to manage our stress during pandemic. Elizabeth, welcome. Hi, thank you so much, Natalia. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Conradi, and I am a certified health and wellness coach um, trained through Duke Integrative Medicine. I'm based in San Francisco, and I work with clients all over the world. And um, feel free to connect with me on Instagram at wellwithin. So um, next slide, please. Great. So I am delighted to spend the next few minutes uh, with all of you today um, sharing with you some very powerful techniques and activities that we can all do to build our resilience and um, to really support our overall health and well-being during this challenging, these challenging times. Um, and really, it's all about self-care. And so self-care is intentionally taking care of your well-being through restorative activities, routines, and rituals. And, um, you know, if you think about a 24-hour day, everything that we're doing within those 24 hours uh, is either stressing the body or restoring the body. So self-care is essentially finding those moments throughout the day where we can do everything we can to nourish our body, mind, and spirit. And um, self-care is always important throughout life, um, but during this, these times right now, it's even, even more important. And so I ask you to ask yourself throughout your day, how are you caring for yourself right now? So that's a nice, a nice question to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, so we're gonna start with how to instantly release anxiety. So uh, this is at the most basic level of self-care. So when you find yourself in that moment of um, the grip of fear or that fight or flight moment, and I know that many, many people around the world are, are feeling themselves in these moments a lot lately. And so there's um, some really useful techniques that can literally instantly release that feeling. And so the first thing you can do, um, and all of these are, you know, they're with you, they're tools that you have with you 24 hours a day. They're always with you, they're always free. So the first thing you can do is to recognize that you're having a, an anxious moment and slow down your breath. And the only thing you have to remember here is that your exhale is longer than your inhale. So you just start focusing on inhaling through your nose, maybe for a count of three, and then a slow exhale, maybe for a count of six. So just doing that, even for a minute or three minutes, just doing that instantly signals to your body that it's okay and your, your body literally starts calming itself down. So uh, on, on a very real level and then, and then your brain will start realizing that too. And the other thing that's very powerful that you can do while you're focusing on your breath is um, while you're imagining uh, or focusing on breathing in, Imagine that you're slowly breathing in healing protection energy. There's energy around us at all times. And there is healing protection energy out there. And so imagine you are breathing it in. And as you breathe it in, it's literally going into every cell of your body. 
this protection. And then as you're exhaling on your slow exhale, you're slowly exhaling all that worry energy and all that anxiety. That anxiety is literally leaving your body through your breath. And then you inhale more healing protection energy. So that's also um, something that um, has worked very, very efficiently for, for many people. And then the other thing, uh, which is very useful, is you can do this while you're focusing on your breath or uh, on its own, is when you find yourself in a, an, in a group of fear, um, you just simply place your hand over your heart. And this instantly calms your body and your mind. It's, it's as if you're giving yourself some love and you're telling yourself, you know, I'm okay. You're, you're actually giving yourself the human touch. And so if you combine this with slowing your breath, it makes it even more powerful. And then another thing, um, which is also quite useful, um, this comes from energy medicine, is um, tapping the back of your hand. And so uh, it's right on the, on the back of your hand between your wrist and your knuckles in between your fourth and fifth finger. So in between your ring finger and your pinky finger. And then you just start tapping right there. And you tap for about a minute. And this also instantly activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which is that rest and digest nervous system. It's the exact opposite from your fight or flight nervous system. And so it instantly takes you out of fight and flight and brings you into the rest and digest calming. It calms your body. And then after a minute, if you're still feeling a little anxious, then you can switch and move over to the other hand. And then another useful tip is once you've, once you've done, you know, one, two, or, or three of the ones we just discussed is asking yourself four questions about that worried thought that you just had. So this, these questions come from the work of Byron Katie. Um, she wrote a book, Loving What Is, and here's the picture of the book. And the first question is to ask yourself, and you may even want to write this down, you know, on a piece of paper or a journal, is this thought true? So just ask yourself. We often have a worried thought and we go, our brains go to worst case scenario, but worst case scenario often doesn't happen. So the first question, is this thought true? Question number two, can I absolutely know it's true? Like 100%, am I 100% sure it's true? Question number three, what happens when you believe the thought? So how do you react? How does your body react when you believe that fearful thought? Does your heart start racing? You know, do you feel tense in your shoulders? You know, what, what's going on in your body when you're believing that thought? Just becoming aware, becoming aware of that. And then number four, who would I be without this thought? So imagine that you don't have the thought who would you be without it would you be calmer what would you be doing right now if you if you weren't worrying about the thought so um those are those are four also questions that um many people find very useful to help them get out of that um the grip of fear next slide please okay so immediately after having that anxious moment. So hopefully you've calmed yourself down just a bit or more than a bit. So the next, the next suggestion is to shift your focus now on things that you're grateful for. So now you're no longer focused on that fearful thought. Instead, what is something, uh, what is something else you can think about? So maybe you're grateful for the safe home that you have. Um, you're grateful for, um, you know, the warm water, the, the warm shower that you're able to take, you're grateful for your family, you're grateful for, you know, the healthy, delicious food that you have to eat, or you're grateful for, you know, the, the book, your favorite book that you're reading. So anything, it could, you could go on and on and on about what you're grateful for, but just focusing on that. And then next is to actually do something now. So do something that brings you joy. You're, you're basically recovering from a fearful moment. So bring joy into your life now. You've earned it. So maybe that's having a cup of hot chocolate and maybe turning on, you know, your favorite song or some relaxing music and 
Maybe it's, um, you know, reading a book and sitting in your favorite chair or watching a, a heartwarming movie, watching something that brings you joy. Um, anything that brings you joy, um, you know, even if you just spend five minutes doing it, it's going to, it's going to, um, change your emotional state, uh, very much. And then the next thing is to practice acts of kindness. So anytime that we do anything for another person, it could be a simple smile at someone that you're living with. You know, you pass them in the hallway and you just give them a smile. That's an act of kindness. And anytime we give an act of kindness to another person, not only does the recipient benefit, but the giver of the act of kindness benefits even more. Um, so it, you release oxytocin. The, the recipient oxytocin goes up, which is the feel-good hormone, but the giver of the act of kindness, their oxytocin surges even more. So whenever we can be kind to another person is really, is really helping, um, helping us feel good and it's helping our immune system and it's helping us uh, be healthy. And then other examples of acts of kindness, call a friend, Maybe someone you haven't talked to in a while, just check in, check in with them, call them and say, how are you doing? How, how are you getting through all this? Um, connect with loved ones in your home um, and, you know, laugh with them, share some jokes. I know there's lots of really clever, interesting, humorous things going around the internet right now. Um, so, you know, uh, watch some of that, laugh, laugh with them, play board games, um, share that you appreciate them. And when you share joy with another person, you're not only boosting your immune system, but you're boosting theirs as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, moving on to everyone's um, forced stay at home. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. And he says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so if we think about, you know, this forced stay at home shelter in place that, you know, many of us um, around the world are, uh, it's our new reality right now. If you think of it as a beautiful gift, so it's, it's literally a gift and it's keeping everyone safe. So um, with the, you know, the utmost respect and gratitude to all the people that are going out into the world and they're still working there, you know, the healthcare providers, the grocery store, you know, everyone who works at the grocery stores, the pharmacists, the delivery people, like all of those people were so grateful that they're going out to, to help our lives continue and to keep us healthy and safe. But for those of us who can stay home, um, it's a gift for ourselves that we can stay in our in our home and it's also a gift because we're helping not spread the virus so um that's a, that's another perspective to look at it and then there's a lot of talk about social distancing um and i encourage i encourage everyone to think about it as physical distancing but still socially connecting and maybe socially connecting even more than ever so physically we can't be with other people but this is a time to really spend quality time you know on the phone or you know over social media really connecting we have the extra time now to really connect with those that we care about and catch up with friends we haven't spoken to in a while and then instead of the term self self-isolation or home isolation um i invite you to embrace this as you would as if you were attending a rejuvenating wellness retreat so lots of people go on vacations um, for you know silent retreats or you know retreats to really um, spend time reflecting on being fully present with yourself and then also spending time reflecting on how you can be fully present and engaged with with others with those in your home and you know with those that you connect with on the phone, um, even though you're not physically with them. So I encourage you to imagine like you're in a, a sanctuary retreat. And another way to help make your home sanctuary more comfortable is to create a huga at home. So huga is 
um, a Danish word, and it means creating comfort and joy in your everyday environment and experiences. So it's everything about creating coziness and warmth and comfort in your home for one. So for example, maybe you're sitting on your couch and you have your, you know, a blanket wrapped around you and, um, you know, you have your, you know, your cup of coffee or your cup of tea and maybe you have a candle lit. Maybe you have a diffuser with essential oils. So you're making your environment very cozy and, and comfortable. And then to bring in the experience part, Huga also is spending quality time with those people that we care about the most. So it's, it's really about, you know, um, small intimate gatherings and spending quality time together. And so uh, I, I invite you to, to create those moments with the people in your household that you are maybe living with, um, or you can even do it on the phone or through Zoom. You can create Huga moments with people that you're close to that are living somewhere else through, you could, uh, you know, connect and you can both be having a Huga moment together. Um, and the other, uh, one other great opportunity we are all blessed with right now is with this extra time is to focus on self-improvement. And a very interesting study that came out of Britain recently, um, they interviewed or they surveyed Six, uh, they surveyed 2,000 people in um, Britain, and 60% of them said that they are using this extra time while they're staying at home to focus on self improvement. Um, and some examples they mentioned where they wanted to, um, many of them are taking online classes to learn new skills, um, they're learning new languages, they're learning how to become a master chef. Um, they're taking virtual museum tours. There's lo lots of tours around the world are, off, are opening up their tours virtually. Um, and they're, they're, they're learning how to sew. They're learning how to knit. I mean, the, it's just endless, um, anything that interests you. And some of the uh, uh, places that you can go online um, our Skillshare or Open Culture Masterclass, and there's, there's so many others as well. Um, so it's a great opportunity uh, for that as well. Next slide, please. So sleep. So sleep and rest is also one of the most important things we can do um, in general, but especially, especially right now. Um, so rest is really crucial and, and some deep quality sleep is really crucial for helping our stress resilience and for keeping our immune system strong. And one of the most powerful ways we can do this is um, daylight. Uh, so seeing the daylight is really the secret to setting your circadian rhythm. And when we set our circadian rhythm, um, we're able to sleep when it's dark out at night and get deep restorative sleep. And that's really the key as well to, to getting into deep sleep, um, which rejuvenates when we're sleeping, where every cell in our body is rejuvenating and healing and keeping itself healthy. And so one recommendation I like to share is getting exposure to the morning sun. And I know a lot of us can't go outside right now, um, so I invite you to maybe find a window in your home where the sun pours in and sitting in front of that window. Um, I know in my house, I have a little nook in a hallway and I never thought of putting a chair there ever. And now I've noticed the sun pours in that little nook. And so now I have a chair there. And so I can get some morning sun. I can sit with my coffee cup and it's almost like I'm outside. And then um, other ways to regulate your circadian rhythm is, if possible, to eat a lighter meal in the evening, and that way your body is finished digesting food before it is ready to sleep for the evening. And of course, avoiding caffeine or alcohol in the evening, which could also interrupt sleep. And then um, keeping a, a schedule, waking up and going to sleep the same time every day also really helps, really helps you get um, the best restorative sleep if your body is used to going to bed and waking up every day at the same time. And um, exercising every day. So again, I know we can't go outside, but 
um, you know, at home videos, cardio, stretching, walking up and down the stairs in your home if, if you have them. Um, we can get really creative with that. And also there's been a lot of research out of um, the blue zones, which are, are zone, the five different zones across the world where they have the highest concentration of centenarians who are thriving in their life. And some really interesting research that came out of that is that uh, just moving your body, they, they don't go to gyms, they don't, you know, work out every day, but they're always, their bodies are constantly in motion, whether they're, they're cooking, they're gardening, they're doing laundry, they're always doing something. And so they're always moving your body. So even just keeping that in mind so that you're just not sitting all day while you're at home. And then um, the other thing really important for restorative sleep is to have um, do whatever we can throughout the day to calm our stress levels. I know we just discussed a few techniques. Um, so if we can calm our stress levels, maybe through uh, one important one, I think would be minimizing the current news media, which is, you know, f f uh, full of scary stuff right now. And so, you know, I, I've done this personally for myself. Um, I've cut way back on how much, how many times I check the news during the day. And I have found that it has, you know, it really does have an effect um, to calm the body down. And then also deep breathing, maybe some meditation as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is um, a, a, a suggestion is to turn your bedroom into a sleep sanctuary. And, um, it's very easy to do. So here's some suggestions on this chart here that comes from the Institute of Functional Medicine. Um, the body sleeps best when it's in a little bit of a cooler environment. So maybe turning, you know, turning down your heater in the evening, um, having a dark environment. So you know, maybe if there's street lights, if you live in a city that come in, uh, maybe sleeping with a sleep mask or uh, if, if that's possible. Um, having a quiet, um, quiet environment, maybe sleeping with earplugs if you need to. Um, of course, um, not looking at blue screens at least an hour or two before bed, you know, no computers, cell phones, TVs, that will really help, help your sleep. Um, maybe taking a bath before bed or having a nice cup of chamomile tea, anything that can really calm your body and help you help it um, feel peaceful. Um, having a, you know, doing whatever you can to make your bed comfortable. So, you know, clean linens, um, you know, comfortable, cozy blankets, um, making sure that your room is, your bedroom is clean and clutter free. So this is a great opportunity to clean the clutter out of your bedroom um, so that you can really have peaceful sleep. Um, so I invite you to try some of these as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so Rituals and routines. So uh, routines and rituals really do bring a calming structure to our day. And um, they do make us happier. They make us feel more in control of our day, make us feel more productive, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I invite you, while everyone's um, schedule has um, shifted with, with our, you know, staying at home, I invite you to still try to keep your routine or create a new routine as much as possible. So, um, you know, waking up at the same time every day, you know, making your bed, taking a shower, doing whatever you do throughout your day, working, in, you know, the same hours that you would normally work, etc. having dinner at the same time, all of that, like keep, keep a routine as much as you can. And um, I invite you to add some rituals into your day. So rituals um, really help bring calming energy and, and peace and self-care into our day as well. So for example, in the morning, maybe start with, you know, some warm lemon water, which is so so soothing um, for the body. Uh, maybe a little meditation or some light movement or stretching in the morning or, you know, saying some positive affirmations or intentions for your day, you know, how you want your, how you visualize your day to unfold um, midday, um, maybe setting, setting an alarm on your phone, you know, at, at three o'clock every day, you're going to have a cup of tea and you're going to focus on your breath um, or maybe you're going to take a short nap. Um, and then for evening, 
Um, again, what, can, what rituals can you incorporate into your evening to really wind your body down and prepare for sleep? So maybe that's a warm bath before bed or reading a book, not on a, not on a screen, but a physical book. Um, maybe some lavender oil in a diffuser if you have one or reflecting in your journal, things like that. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful to have rituals um, in our days. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, one thing I wanted to uh, acknowledge also is um, while we talk about routines and, and introducing rituals, we also have to remember and be mindful of the fact that um, we are all human and we're all going through this uh, a pandemic that none of us have experienced anything like this before. So it's okay if, if something on your routine doesn't happen or if something on your ritual doesn't happen, it's, it's okay. So just knowing that and then just start trying again tomorrow. So I saw this, um, this, I guess it's like a quote on Instagram. It was posted on yoga journal and I, I just felt like it was such wise, um, such a wise thing to remember to forgive yourself if your day doesn't go exactly as you planned. You forgive yourself for what didn't happen that day, for the emails you didn't respond to, the deadlines you didn't make. You know, forgive yourself for all that and just try again tomorrow. And the last one here is I forgive myself for being human during a pandemic. So just, the, I guess the biggest takeaway here is treat yourself with kindness always. Treat yourself with compassion especially in a moment that you feel like you may have let yourself down, treat yourself with the utmost compassion, forgive yourself and, and just move on. This, will, this is the closing slide and I um, would like to invite you all to join me in a very short loving kindness meditation. And this is a meditation that um, I invite you to maybe say when you wake up in the morning, uh, or maybe say it, you know, in, in the middle of your day, anytime you're feeling anxious or um, and or when you go to sleep at night, maybe it's the last thing you say before you fall asleep. And also, it's a wonderful opportunity to say anytime you're washing your hands for 20 to 30 seconds. Um, if you say this, this loving kindness meditation you know, two or three times um, while you're while you're washing your hands as well. So um, I invite you all to um, close your eyes if you feel comfortable and we'll just take a few slow, deep breaths. So a slow inhale, maybe for four seconds. And then a slow exhale for seven. Now another slow inhale. And gently exhale slowly. And one more, slowly inhale. And a longer exhale. And I invite you to also place your hand over your heart if it feels, if that feels right for you. And now say to yourself, either, either silently or out loud, may I be well. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be healthy. Be healthy. May I be filled with loving kindness. Be And now think of someone who is very dear to you in your life. 
think of that person and now send them loving kindness. You can say their name when you're saying this. May this dear person in my life be well. May this dear person in my life be happy. May this dear person in my life be healthy. May this dear person in my life be filled with loving kindness. And now we'll send loving kindness to all beings, anyone who may be going through a challenging time right now. May all beings be well. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. Take a few more slow inhales and longer exhales. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes. Thank you, everyone. May you all be safe and well. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was so wonderful to complete our second part of webinar about self-care with uh, guided meditation. And um, I want to, uh, again, repeat the words you mentioned about uh, gratitude, that many of us um, should embrace uh, our home isolation and uh, really be grateful for everyone who making our time at home safe as healthcare workers, people who work in groceries, transportation and pharmacies, uh, we're grateful to all of them uh, making this opportunity for us to be safer in a shelter at home. And thank you for all of our attendees, all our um, panelists who took their time and shared all their resources to help us to have an integrative approach to self-care and help the renal patients to manage their wellness as well as uh, manage their disease. And I would like to invite you to our final part of our webinar, our discussion, to speak with uh, renal patients and hear their story, how they are living under shelter in place and how they found the best ways and what are their practices of daily living under the restrictions of uh, home isolation. So I would like to invite you to meet Anel Aguirre, Anel uh, based in California in Los Angeles. And Anel has been 23 years uh, post-transplant kidney patient. Anel, wonderful to have you here. Hi, um, my name is Anel. Um, a little bit of uh, backstory. I was diagnosed at birth. And um, my, parent, my doctors always told my parents that at some point I, I was going to need a, a transplant, a kidney transplant. And in July of 1986, when I was 12 years old, um, that's that was the time that I um, started dialysis. And then exactly a month later, um, I received a kidney transplant in August of 1996. Um, so, so far I've been 23 years post-transplant and I'm currently um, between stage three and stage four of kidney disease.
And then um, now I want to talk about a little bit about how I did to prepare for being in this um, shelter in place. Um, the first thing I did was make sure that I had plenty of medication on hand. Um, as a post-transplant, I depend on um, immunosuppressants to keep my transplant going, um, for my body not to be uh, strong enough to fight this, this kidney that is not origin originally mine. Um, so what I did, I called my pharmacy, my um, different pharmacies because that's, um, I use different pharmacies to get my medication. So I called, spoke to the pharmacist, um, so the pharmacist can override for extra medication. I wanted to make sure I had one to two, three months um, additional medication on hand, just in case, um, because things are so uncertain right now, just in case it uh, you know, the pharmacies has to shut down for whatever reason. So I just wanted to make sure I had plenty of medication to keep me going for the next three months. And then the next thing I did was contact my doctor. I had a few doctor appointments scheduled for the month of March and April. And I contacted my doctor to make sure that, you know, if it was safe for me to come in or what were my, what were my alternatives? Luckily, um, my doctor said, you know what, you don't have to come in right now. Um, we only want to see patients that are, um, you know, they have symptoms or things like that. We can reschedule your appointments. So my appointments have been rescheduled. Uh, but again, having that um, contact with my doctor, making sure that I keep constant communication with, with my doctors to make sure that um, my kidney still, my transplant is still functioning. Uh, and then after that, um, I, for me, has been important to keep a routine. Um, I use uh, the, the time blocking method uh, to keep me on track of things that I need to do throughout the day. So I've been working from home for, this is the fourth week, so about a month. And the first week was um, very stressful for me. I didn't plan my day. I was watching the news the entire time and I was just panicking with a lot of anxiety. But then I decided to not watch the news anymore. Uh, just, you know, keep, stay updated, but not obsessively watch the news. And then I also um, wanted to keep a routine. So I created a schedule for myself to stay on track. Um, so my schedule kind of looks like this. Um, waking up and then going for a walk with my husband. And then after that, like around 7.30, shower, eat breakfast, get ready, and get ready for the day. Um, 8.30, start work. And throughout my day, um, I listen to positive podcasts um, to just stay positive. And then I take a break around 10, 15, and then um, continue working from 10.30 to about one o'clock, one to 2 p.m. I take lunch. And um, from two to five, I continue working. And I end my, my work day at 5 p.m. From five to six, I cook dinner. And um, I have dinner with my family from 6 to 9 p.m. I usually do homework, watch a movie, um, watch funny YouTube videos. I bake or I craft. Um, I usually, I like um, decorating my planner or doing some crafting. Um, and then around 9 or 10 p.m. I go to sleep. And then um, other things that I have done is um, making sure that I do some self-care. Um, I love to cook and bake. Prior to this self-isolation, um, I didn't have much time to do anything other than work and being stuck in traffic. Um, so I, I'm taking this as an opp opportunity to do some of the stuff that I really like doing, such as cooking, baking, um, crafting, watching some of my favorite movies, um, and TV shows and relaxing. And um, 
the most important thing is for me to stay home, not go out other than just for the morning walk. Um, the morning walk, I try to do it at, at a time where I know there isn't a lot of people out. So um, I don't have to face that, um, I guess that issue of like coming into contact with somebody. Um, I'm lucky that my husband um, is able to go to the grocery store and shop for groceries, but I've also been using delivery, um, delivery services so that neither me or my husband have to go out. And another thing that I do, do um, is wash my hands often as recommended. I've been doing that for, since I can remember. And, um, and also cleaning the surfaces, making sure that the surfaces have been sanitized every single day. And that's pretty much all I do. Excellent. Uh, thanks Thank so much. You. So many useful tips. And um, I'm so thrilled that you're using this time to really uh, learn something new, bake and enjoy yourself and avoid LA traffic. That could be quite yes. difficult. <laughs> I've been um, so many hours in, in my day. Yeah, thanks so much, Anel, for sharing uh, your tips and uh, something that you have learned through this experience. We'll be sharing your Instagram account. And if anyone has questions to Anel about her experiences being productive at home, you can reach out to her. Uh, thank you again. And I would like to invite you to our final speaker, again, Wilson Du, and with his experience and his approach to uh, self-care uh, during the home isolation or home retreat. So Wilson, share with us your insights and looking forward to get inspired. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy time, but I mean, it's, it's not too different from uh, how life was before, but uh, just a little bit more, um, more careful. So life with COVID-19, um, I treat, I assume everybody's infected. So when I, when I see somebody or if, if, if I'm out, I, I avoid touching people. Uh, and I'm, I'm a hugger. I like to hug people. And now it's, it's a little bit different where I can't hug people. I like to shake their hands. I can't do that right now. But I wash my hands just like Anel does uh, religiously all the time, prior, after, any type of contact, going out, uh, any of that stuff. I wash my hands constantly, uh, hand sanitizers, all that stuff. I keep wipes and hand sanitizers in, in the car. So anytime I have to leave, um, if I go anywhere, it, I'm wiping everything down before and afterwards. I'm hand sanitizing my I'm sanitizing my hands before and after I, I come in and out. I have gloves and masks with me at all times. So if I do go out, I'm, I'm wearing it. And um, every anytime I go out, whether it be to dialysis, to the clinic, to the pharmacy, getting some stuff, immediately when I come home, my shoes stay outside and I take all of my clothes and I throw them. I, I walk directly to the wash. I try not to contaminate anything and just uh, just wash everything that I, I have with me. If I have my phone, I'll sanitize it, my AirPods, things like that. So it's very important to, uh, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. And I, I just try to be cautious on that. That being said, what my daily life is, um, you know, it's it's a little bit bittersweet. Uh, you know, my life before the shelter in place or before this lockdown, I was always surrounded by a lot of people and now it's, it's more staying home, but pretty much my daily life, uh, days of dialysis, I go Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, uh, I'm gloving up. I'm, I'm, I have a mask. I go into dialysis. They check the temperatures prior to reaching up to the main floors. We're washing our hands prior to sitting down in the chair, washing our access, uh, prior to, uh, getting poked. Um, you know, alternatives to opening doors. I, I'm, I'm using my elbows a whole lot, or I'm using, uh, or, or you know, if I, if I'm using the glove, I'm, I'm removing it and putting on a new pair of gloves. I'm wiping down all the parts of the car before getting in and out. Um, again, clothes after dialysis goes directly into the wash, and it's very important. Like uh, Natalia said before, uh, removing the mask is 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 definitely a process. It's uh, doing it carefully, hand sanitizing myself before I get in the car. I'll remove it without touching the surface of the mask and discarding it uh, into the biohazard bin at, at dialysis. Um, Non-dialysis days, uh, you know, uh, just like Elizabeth was saying earlier, it is 
a blessing to be able to work on a lot of things that we weren't able to work on before. Um, there's, I have a lot of hobbies that I always said, oh, if I had the time, I'll play guitar a little bit, I'll sing a little bit more. Um, right now I'm experimenting with different workouts. I, I do spend a lot of time at the gym currently. Uh, benefits of owning a gym is that uh, there's nobody there. And so I can go in there. I use the whole space to myself. Um, and so I, I, I do a lot of workouts. I try to get a lot of workouts on video so I can send it out uh, to other members as well. Um, and just, you know, again, follow all the same sanitary procedures of wiping everything down. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's being able to get caught up on a whole lot of things. Before the shelter in place, life seemed to be a, been moving so quickly, especially with uh, running a business and, and trying to get uh, uh, treatment and, and all that stuff. And now we're able to just take a step back, plan out things a little bit more. And uh, I know that when the shelter in place is, is all done, we'll be uh, back uh, better than ever. So that's, that's my life in a nutshell with living with COVID. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Wilson. Uh, even uh, in such a challenging time, I really appreciate how positive you are and you find all these uh, great projects uh, like playing on guitar, singing, and uh, just developing yeah. your skill yeah. set. Uh, I'm sure everyone in our audience also have those dream uh, occupations we used to do or wanted to try and now we have time for it. So in, in case, guys, you want to play guitar, you can reach out to Wilson. Maybe two of you can practice guitar. Oh, no, lessons. that's great. Don't reach out to me for the guitar. <laughs> I'll give you a workout, not the guitar. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's such a pleasure with uh, all our panelists today to catch up on this conversation, to review the resources available, to go over some of them in high level, some of them going in depth, but certainly we haven't been able to really address every aspect of self-care in this webinar. However, we've been really good going over time and we just can keep talking and it's gonna go to the second, third hour. However, we still have a couple questions that have been asked by attendees of today's webinar and I would like to ask our panelists to answer those questions. Uh, so hope everyone ready. I have a first question to Mathia. Oh, sorry, one of our attendees asked a question about the meal de delivery services to use, um, specifically Freshly or any other meal delivery services. If you could recommend, or maybe some tips when someone deciding to use meal delivery services in terms of nutrition for renal patients, or maybe also any other precautions. Well, freshly, I believe the food's already made when you get it. So it's almost like getting um, fresh made TV dinners. Um, and although I think they're good, I think they're probably a little higher in sodium than you'd want. But a lot of the ones that come to you where you do all the prep work and it's just a recipe, if you can manage those where you are getting, um, you know, three to four ounces of protein with that meal and you're not using... Um, like sauces that are pre-made, but you're able to manage the sodium in there, then I think they're fine. Um, one of the things that I like to do, um, and I can share with Natalia to email out after, is there's a website uh, by the USDA where you can look up foods and look up the different nutritional values. And um, so sometimes there's food in there that you don't know much about. So you can either look it up or, um, review or go to this website and try to find it. Um, but I, I think they're fine and I think it's great to develop some skills. And I have found that after a few rounds of getting the food, um, it can be a little expensive. So you can learn some new techniques, you can learn ways that they do different things, and then you can um, use those going forward, but make your own uh, meals. And, and like I said, if you look at some of the common recipes that you use or some of the common foods that you eat, Sometimes you can see the pattern and create that, just use a little different food, um, you know, different meat, different vegetable, that type of thing. Excellent, thank you so much, Mathia. Uh, just one more thing to add, to just since it's uh, COVID-19, make sure you disinfect uh, the meals that uh, brought in box, and maybe with the disinfection vibes, or uh, the second question I have um, to Shahid, um, as a scientist, uh, is there, is it prohibited 
to have pets like dogs or when you have CKD? At present, or at least in, in, in media and in reports, um, there hasn't been any um, robust or um, substantial evidence to highlight that um, uh, animals um, are you know, more probable to get infected with COVID-19. Um, and as um, you know, research is you know, getting evidenced you know, uh, quite routinely and they're looking, you know, scientists and medics and clinics um, and you know, researchers around the world are looking at this from various perspectives. But um, to answer it you know, uh, specifically right now, um, there isn't um, any specific evidence to say that you know, uh, anyone with pets um, whether it be dogs um, or a cat or any other, you know, uh, animal um, is is likely to be more at higher risk of getting uh, COVID-19. Um, but what what is important, and I think it's it's a message that has been sort of um, highlighted throughout this webinar and you know in in reports is it's absolutely vital wherever. Uh, anyone has any pets um, of any kind it's about keeping them them clean and keeping yourself sanitized as well so it reduces the uh, risk and probability of actually um, having any sort of you know um, dirt or you know um, uh, you know um, uh, microorganisms that could affect, um, you know, your, your general well-being and your immune system. So it is all about keeping clean and sanitized. But yeah, again, just to highlight that there isn't any specific evidence to say that uh, anyone with pets is at higher risk at the moment. Excellent. Uh, so I have another question, Shahid, towards you. And um, okay. uh, you just let me know if you can um, address it. Uh, if you catch COVID, would you stop your immune suppressants? Uh, no. <laughs> Simple answer. If you've been prescribed, um, you know, life, um, you know, long immunosuppression for, you know, your solid organ transplant, then, and, you know, this is prescribed from, you know, your renal team or whoever um, is looking after your health on that side of things. Um, you are not to uh, stop any of your medication, immunosuppression or otherwise, unless, um, you know, it, it, it has been said by, you know, uh, your, you know, uh, renal clinicians or the, the renal team. So uh, no would be the answer to that. Excellent. Thanks so much for your feedback. Uh, so I have another question. I think it will be Elizabeth could answer it, but also I'm sure that uh, some of our Patients advocates also um, can answer it. How can I deal with anxiety and loneliness? Join the warrior class. <laughs> That's good. <one. laughs> That's perfect. So. Um, I would say trying out the practices um, that that um, were shared that I shared, um, seeing if that helps, and also I think um, realizing that it's okay. Like there's a lot of fear and anxiety in the world right now. And realizing that, you know, everybody is not different degrees, but everybody's feeling it. And just sometimes just even realizing that brings me comfort. Um, everyone in the world's going through this together. And then what can we do? What, like you have the power within yourself. Everyone does. Everyone has a power within themselves to pull themselves out of that moment, that moment of fear, that gripping fear. And so it's just recognizing that and tapping into it, tapping into your own ability to pull yourself out and, you know, maybe slowing down your breath, just putting your hand over your heart, slowing down your breath, calling a friend. You know, if you're in a moment of fear, call someone and say, help me. It's, it's perfectly, it's a, it's a sign of strength to tell someone you need help. So call someone or someone that you're living with, say, I'm fearful right now, help me. And just start talking. And, and or the other thing that's really powerful is thinking of what you're grateful for. So I'm, oh, one other thing really quickly is, which I just remembered, which is very powerful, is saying to yourself, even though I don't like how I'm feeling right now, 
can I realize that I'm okay in this moment? Like in this very moment, I am okay. Regardless of the anxiety and the fear thought that you're having, in the moment, in the present moment, you're okay. And then when you say that a few times, it calms your body down and then call a friend or um, uh, do something, it's, it's, think of things you're grateful for or you know, turn on a heartwarming movie to get your mind off it. So anything you can do to change focus to something more helpful. I hope that is helpful. Yes, yes, it's uh, very helpful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And uh, Mathia, we have another question. Uh, so Stephen, he has a question about what type of bread to have to avoid salt. Um, you can make your own bread and use a little less salt. Uh, but typically, if you just read the label, um, you're, it's gonna be easier to compare the breads at the counter. Um, a lot of breads are gonna be uh, higher in sodium. So if you can do some of your own homemade bread, bread needs a little bit of salt to um, actually do the reaction that it does to rise and stuff like that, but it doesn't need probably as much as the recipe says, so you may want to test that a little bit. I, I think it's very calming to need bread, so, but that maybe is just me, but I, I think it's a very calming um, practice. Uh, so that would be my advice. Just compare your labels, look for serving sizes. Um, sometimes it may say two slices, sometimes it may say one slice, um, but that would be my recommendation. The last question I want to address that seems some uh, to be very often uh, asked, it's about how can I stay safe on dialysis? And a lot of patients who are still attend dialysis treatments, they're really concerned about the safety uh, to having that additional exposure. And um, I would like Wilson to help me to answer this question. Yeah, um, you know, uh, is, is that uh, as a patient, as a dialysis patient, we all have to be proactive and, and be, be responsible ourselves. Don't rely on the dialysis clinic to, 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 to make sure that you're safe. Don't, don't rely on the dialysis clinic and the nurses and the techs to make sure that they're sanitized. You have to take it upon yourself to make sure that you're sanitized. Make sure that, uh, make sure that you're cleaning up. You're Make sure that you're using gloves. You're paying attention to the techs and the nurses coming by your chair to make sure that they've changed their gloves. Make sure that they're using hand sanitizer, things like that. Uh, but uh, that being said, uh, again, if you can get, get yourselves uh, some PPE as well. Get some gloves, get some masks, uh, because uh, again, once you go into a contaminated area, if you're using a mask, you're not able to reuse that mask, so make sure you have plenty. Um, again, my procedure going into uh, dialysis is, um, when I get into the car before driving out, I'm, I'm, I'm using hand sanitizers, and, I, and then right after I use hand sanitizers, I'll have some gloves. As I go through uh, into dialysis, I, I watch what type of surfaces I touch. Um, especially when I walk into the door of dialysis, I have to hold the door handle to push it in. I'm wearing gloves and at that time, I have another pair of gloves with me. So I'm removing the gloves and I'm putting on a new pair of gloves. And, how you, and also how you remove your gloves instead of just pulling it out and taking it off, you have to remove it from the inside. That way you're not, uh, again, you assume that everything's contaminated. Uh, you, you're washing your access. When, even when you go to the scale to weigh in yourself beforehand, make sure you're not touching the surfaces if you can. Um, and then uh, uh, again, throughout dialysis, really it's, it's uncomfortable to, to lay there with the mask on, but, but I do keep it on. Sometimes it itches. Um, but uh, again, I always, I always have some extra pair of gloves, masks in the car, and just wiping everything down. And after I leave, when I leave the dialysis clinic, Again, another pair of gloves comes off, get into the car, and a pair of gloves comes on. Uh, but before that, I, I will sanitize my hands, uh, put, on, put on a new mask, and just, again, everything, you just have to assume that everybody's contaminated. You have to assume that you're contaminated because, you know, it's, it's one thing for, for, for us as a patient to get, the, get COVID. It's, it's already scary enough. I mean, I think one of my biggest fears or, or bigger fears is actually infecting somebody else. And so since we're in a dialysis clinic with a lot of immunocompromised folks, um, you treat everybody as if they're infected and you treat as if you're, you are infected yourself. So before seeing a loved one, if you have to see a loved one, 
um, make sure that 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 you're you're protecting yourself for for them. Make sure that when you go into the house that you completely disinfect everything, throwing your clothes in the wash. If you need to take a shower, I, I don't think I've showered so many times now. I've showered three, four times a day sometimes, um, and just washing hands uh, all the time and washing your hands just like in the diagram. Do it. Give it a thorough wash. I don't know if you, if any of you seen the video on. Uh, on social media of, of uh, somebody wearing a glove and they put some color pink to show you how yeah, you're not cleaning your yeah, hands completely. Yeah, so like glitter so, kind of style. Yeah, it's like glitter. So you, you see how you need to cover all of your hand. And you know, I have a habit, I like touching my face, which you know, I shouldn't be doing, but I like to touch my face all the time. I already sanitized my hands three times during this webinar. But um, yeah, just again, treat, Treat yourself as if you're infected so that you don't get anybody else infected. Treat everybody else around you at the, the clinic, the nurses, the techs, treat them as if they're infected and be proactive in, in, in just being observant of everything that you do, everything that you touch, even get to the point where, where you're observing the techs and the nurses that actually come to you. Awesome. Thanks so much about sharing all this uh, self-discipline and how to be thoughtful about it. I just know that, uh, Shahid, you were kind of numbing and wanting to add something uh, from the scientific perspective. Would you have any additional feedback uh, to what Wilson said? Ultimately, you ha almost have to think that from a, it, it, when, you, when someone is on dialysis, their, their blood is being purified or it's being cleansed. So, you know, all the toxins are being rid of, you know, um, through, you know, dialysis treatment. So if one is to think of um, dialysis in that sense and how it purifies the bloods, you know, and replenishes, you know, and stores your, your red cell stores, um, then it's almost like that's done from the physiological perspective internally. And also it, it whilst it sort of messes the immune system a little bit it also actually makes the immune system a little bit more stronger because you've got to think that the good stuff is coming in the bad stuff is going out but as wilson absolutely rightly says um that all that um mechanism and that discipline is it's absolutely important from the exterior point of view the hand sanitizing the masks and all of the other things that's for your exterior self so just as, as someone who's dialyzing, you know, is keeping, it, it's all about purifying the inside um, in, in, a, in a sort of a traumatic way in some way, but also from an exterior point of view, the hands, you know, keeping clean on the outside is absolutely important. So the two sort of, I just wanted to highlight the two go hand in hand, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much, Shahid. Appreciated your feedback. And again, guys, it's been two hours. It's been amazing. Yeah. We can keep going. Uh, we really made a circle of uh, great panelists, great people here. And um, what we're learning that, uh, um, you know, from today's conversations could be just in the beginning. And anyone who's attending this webinar, please submit your questions if you have any uh, to the email natale at renalmate.com. Natale at Rumail renalmate.com. Again, if you want to re-engage with any speakers of today, uh, we'll make sure to follow up with the presentation, their contact information, and you can also reach out and ask for the introduction. To all our panelists, thank you so much for your time, for your um, work to prepare very insightful information, uh, but also for you know just being here in this challenging time, uh, to be a strong support for renal patients. And uh, uh, your work is uh, highly appreciated. I'm so grateful to have this community around um, the world uh, to be able to provide this kind of collaborative efforts. And uh, all your tips were amazing. I'm going forward to bake today. <laughs> I need to exercise, I need to sleep well. All of this I'll be adapting on my own and hope you'll take some of this lesson also for your own self-care.